Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden of Witts University in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, the first time I went to China was back in 1989, and I'm going to try and paint a picture for you of what it was like back then. Um, I went to visit, I have a, a Chinese family there who were very close to my family. When I went there, they, they asked me to bring canned coffee because they didn't have coffee. They had, in fact, they still had ration tickets for coffee. Um, there were no cars. Everybody was wearing either a black, a gray, or a brown uh, suit, which was known in those days as a Mao suit, only bicycles. The air was very, very clean because there really wasn't much industrial or industrialization or manufacturing, and there was no pollution. So it was really a beautiful time at that to, to be there. But China was still an extraordinarily poor country. And its influence, for the most part, was limited to China. And even within China, there's always been this tension in history of the borders expanding and contracting. Now we fast forward 40 years and China's become the world's second largest economic power. It's the world's number one computer market, number one car market, number one phone market. It's now exacting influence uh, in the Asia Pacific region in ways that we could never have imagined. Huge tracts of the South China Sea are now firmly under China's control. China's exerting power internationally. We have Chinese fleets that are flying or sailing in the Mediterranean. We have Chinese warships that are going to Cape Town. The Chinese are uh, operating naval operations off the coast of Somalia and the Gulf of Aden. So where we are today and where we were 40 years ago is unrecognizable. And this is having an impact on how China's worldview is playing out on the global stage. And it's really timely right now, in part because of the rise of Donald Trump in the United States, Brexit in Europe, Marine Le Pen in France, and the backlash against globalization in the West at the same time of the embrace of globalization by the Chinese. So I thought this would be a great opportunity for us to look at the Chinese worldview. And then what we're going to do is let our listeners connect the dots and how it affects Africa. Because Africa is going to be involved in this in, in lots of direct and also indirect ways. Um, the fact is, is that China is, is affecting change all over the world. And we don't yet know how and how that change is going to happen, what it's going to be and how it's going to affect Africa. And one of the, the difficulties in Africa of understanding China is that a lot of Africans, and I won't say most, I don't know if it's a lot or a few, but a lot of you and I run into this quite a bit kind of look at the Chinese oftentimes as being similar to Europeans, that they are foreigners. And here's another foreigner. And so much of the African worldview is set up and kind of defined through uh, a European perspective and a European lens. So we thought today would be great to bring on a China expert to help kind of, you know, explain the Chinese worldview and the Chinese perspective. Uh, François Godemont is the director of the Asian China Program and a senior policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations and the author of the 2015 book, Contemporary China Between Mao and Market. François is also a consultant for the policy planning staff at the French Foreign Ministry in Paris. François, welcome to the show. Hey, glad to talk to both of you. Excellent. Well, we're so happy to have you in part because you just recently wrote a paper for the European Council on Foreign Relations called Expanded Ambitions, Shrinking Achievements, How China Sees the Global Order. And, uh, and I think it's so interesting that you're talking about the global order at this time, in part because we're see we've seen the rise of the populist anti-globalization in the West. And then Xi Jinping himself at Davos, really the pinnacle of, uh, of, of the global establishment you know, saying a ringing endorsement of it. And the, the Chinese have become something of an enthusiastic supporter of globalization, in part because they've seen concrete benefits over the past 40 years, while in the West, it's a different story. Talk to us a little bit about that tension that you were writing about in your paper between the Chinese view of globalization and what you're seeing in France, Europe, and in the West. There is globalization and there is a global order, and the two are not the same. Uh, globalization to the Chinese is the process of free trade, uh, market integration, uh, a Ricardian system uh, where those who have the most advantageous methods uh, will win uh, in foreign trade. And the Chinese think that they are winning uh, in many areas. And so they support globalization. They support free trade. Uh, they have become the most enthusiastic promoters of win-win. They do that, by the way, 
from an exceptional position because they were admitted to WTO, the World Trade Organization, in 2001 as a developing economy, uh, an economy that at the time was almost a midget compared to what it is today, not only the world's second economy, but the world's first exporting nation, the world's first industrial country. Uh, the value of Chinese industrial production is higher uh, than that of the U.S., even though the quality uh, is perhaps not equivalent uh, in some cases. So there we are. Uh, it's a China that sees the world through its foreign exports, its foreign markets, and it's a China that expands abroad. You could call it an unintentional empire. This was not a strategy to build an empire. This is not a strategy to reach global hegemony. China doesn't have an interest in running the world. It's pretty happy to see the West keeping some of the rules, uh, paying some of the public costs, uh, and China itself uh, enjoying the concrete benefits of trade. So it's a mixed view on globalization. And really the problem for the developed uh, economies and for, for others as well is what will we do when China becomes the number one economy, will we still accept that China has uh, exceptional rules, deroga derogations to normal rules because it's still classified as a developing economy? And I think the, the, the source uh, of the anxiety about globalization uh, in the industrialized West uh, rests on the realization uh, that we're no longer having a relationship with a developing economy. This is an economy that matches us uh, in many ways, yet enjoys uh, special benefits uh, under rules that are now 15 years old. That's for globalization. One of, one of the, the complications of, of this issue is that China also frequently presents itself as a kind of a leader of the developing world. Um, do you foresee, how do you foresee that changing in, in the future? I think that's changing quite rapidly. I would say China in many cases is attractive to developing economies because China is pragmatic, because China exports and does abroad what it does best. That means bridges, railways, ports, construction, uh, factories churning out uh, inexpensive goods. China is really number one in that respect. And it's got a huge financial leverage thanks to the uh, trade surplus uh, it enjoys. Uh, but that's, how should I say, that's uh, practical. Uh, that's not about rules. That's not about political leadership. The differences and the gap between China and developing economies is now huge. China is as much a developed economy, an industrialized economy. It's a financial power. Uh, it has interests which diverge greatly uh, from most developing economies and even from emerging economies, even with, shall we say, India, Brazil, Indonesia, Turkey, it may at times share some political positions that we don't want the West to rule us. We don't want the West to impose norms that we dislike. Uh, but on economic terms, they're strictly competitors. And usually China wins hands down the competitions. So more and more, the links of China, for example, with a group of the 77 least developed uh, economies is more rhetorics than reality. And, and you use the word pragmatic and practical. And I'd like to throw another word out there, it, 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 transactional. And this is a word that's often used to describe Donald Trump's foreign policies, that he looks at everything in a real politic type of transaction. You know, someone's not paying enough, someone's not doing enough. And I think this is very familiar type of thinking for the Chinese, and particularly in places like Africa and South America and here in South Asia, where there has been a quid pro quo. We will give you low interest financing, we will build infrastructure, you then give us access to your markets and access to your natural resources. Um, so this transactional worldview, 
is seems to be one that is on the rise. Would you describe the Chinese approach to foreign policy and their worldview in a similar terms that Donald Trump does with regards to being transactional? Absolutely. I would use an Asian term, which was first applied to Japan 60 years ago, uh, or, or rather now 80 years ago, before World War II. Uh, and the term was a valueless foreign policy, a foreign policy that's not encumbered by values, by norms, by rules, uh, that is mostly about bilateral dealings. Of course, China expresses some values, but that's at a very high abstract level. In practice, it deals. And often, uh, it's got an advantage there. Since we're talking uh, about Africa, I, I, I am reminded of a documentary movie, uh, a French documentary movie that I saw on a Chinese presence in Cameroon that was extremely educative about how the Chinese uh, went about successfully uh, inside the Cameroon economy. But to me, the clincher was at the end of the movie, the inauguration of a brand new stadium, uh, which had been done uh, in part with French aid and all the French worthies, former ministers and, and, and others were there for the inauguration with the government of Cameron. But backstage stood uh, the Chinese guy who had run the construction company that made the stadium. And he gestured to the camera and he said, you know, who built the stadium? Us. Uh, and that was, you know, the clincher. They know how to do things. Uh, they know what mutual benefit is. Uh, or at least uh, if they see one, they will play one. I would note, however, that the situation can solve very easily. For example, for more than a decade, China, uh, sorry, Africa enjoyed high prices for energy, high prices for raw materials. Uh, and so the terms of the deal were not too unfavorable. But when international prices go down, as they have in the past few years, then what emerges are huge uh, Chinese surpluses, uh, and suddenly uh, many of these economies may feel short-changed. So in that sense, uh, we're back to the old unequal exchange relation uh, that existed between the West and Africa. Uh, it's, just the, it's just the Chinese who practice it today. And not to mention the vast amounts of debt that a lot of African countries are taking on from the Chinese, which is once again also reminiscent of the of the bad old days of the 1980s and 90s as well, that, you know, Uganda and it Uganda is, but and I, are yes, buried but in debt, and Kenya as well. I agree with you, but I wonder if uh, that's not part of the unintended empire. Uh, that is, the Chinese are piling up loans uh, that clearly will not be re re repaid. Look at Venezuela. Uh, which is the prime example. Look at the situation with Algeria, for example, uh, where they are more and more uh, into this uh, and where Algeria's capacity to repay really depends on the price of oil in the next few years. Uh, in, in, in many cases, the Chinese have really downloaded a lot of money because they had surpluses, and it's not clear that they will get back that money. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you think the West will react um, to a, a future China, if, say, China becomes the number one economy. Um, you, you point out in the paper that that you know the look, there was a, this kind of conflation of Western views of globalization and Western views of how a global system should work. Um, you know, kind of with free markets, for example, having both an economic, a kind of pragmatic economic value and an a kind of moral, moral and um, and you know, kind of legal, um, uh, you know, kind of value valuation in the West. Um, do you foresee China having a similar kind of uh, kind of conflation of of values and economy, or is there is was that a, a unique kind of Western system? No, I think that was unique, uh, and also it's a built up uh, image. In fact, the Western inspired or American inspired order after 1945 did not carry all those values. Those values came later, as the system expanded as the West won the Cold War, and I identify a period after 1989 
and up to maybe one or two years ago, when values and norms and requirements for the international system kept rising. In part, it was also tied to a lot of optimism. Uh, the Chinese are much more restricted in their understanding of what a global order is. There are lots of things that they think are not included in a global order, or at least are not mandatory. They dislike the uh, expansion of international law. They dislike interference, as they often say, into domestic affairs. They dislike things like uh, verification of commitments. So uh, let's look at climate, for example. They're very hostile to verification uh, inside countries of what the countries are really doing. So they have a much more restricted understanding of how the global order works. Uh, it's much closer to uh, what the global order may have been just a few years after World War II. Uh, they recognize, to some extent, uh, international law, but not the expansion of international law. So, for example, things like the uh, law of the sea, uh, they're currently challenging the capacity of the court to arbitrate uh, the quarrels they have uh, in, 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 in the South China Sea. Uh, they uh, dislike humanitarian intervention, uh, although they do endorse uh, peacekeeping uh, when it is supposed to prevent international chaos, that is, war between nations, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a much more restricted uh, understanding. It, it's something I, I, I dubbed at some point the low-cost international order. But I can see a lot of the values that you've articulated about how the Chinese see the world may actually appeal to a lot of African leaders and South American and certainly here in South Asia who don't want the West to intervene, who don't want necessarily to be held to account for climate change, uh, you know, expenses that may be quite high. Uh, a lot of those things when it comes to human rights and civil rights, which the West has been very, very demanding on for concessions over the past years and held a lot of these smaller countries hostage through the IMF and the World Bank and whatnot to, to make political changes. Um, so in some ways, I can see that being quite a popular position to take for the Chinese to become a more, um, you know, credible leader for a lot of these countries. It could indeed be very popular, and, and we have seen uh, the formation of clubs of countries, countries that can say no, can say no together. Uh, China has been very efficient uh, in the formation of SAS clubs, whether it's about trade, whether it's about climate, whether it's about international intervention. But there is another side to that coin. Uh, and the other side is that China is an extremely big country. Uh, it itself now professes that it's a, it's a large country. And for example, in its own neighborhood, it explains not implicitly, but quite explicitly, uh, that China has to be respected as a large country by small countries. So that it's all fine uh, for uh, 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 developing countries or rulers with different political systems to try and push back the West's many requirements in many areas. Uh, but it's something else to be facing China alone, to be under the pressure of, of a country that in fact has very few restrictions and which has infinitely more power. So uh, there is a trade-off and my, my rule of thumb on this is that you're going to find China in international leagues of countries which want to turn down something, uh, and China happens to agree. You're going much less to find leagues of country with China who want something positively or who push something positively, and even less uh, are you likely to see countries uh, that do not hedge towards China in security terms or in sometimes in, in commercial or economic negotiations. You wrote at the in your paper towards the end, you said China may rule the world one day, but only if the West has lost the capacity or the will to. What does a world run by China look like? <laughs> it's not a 19th century world because China uh, would be... Uh, hurt if uh, tr free trade disappeared. And one of, one of the risks uh, 
of, of China's conception of a low-cost economic order is that others may not agree to keep the bits and pieces that China would like to see. Uh, so in the end, uh, China may be shooting itself in the foot because after all, it's a global power. It needs international integration. It needs, you know, it's, it's still an absentee landlord in many places where if there is no international law, well, Chinese interests will be challenged too. And Chinese residents uh, will be in danger too. So to some extent, you could say it's a new uh, empire. As all empires, it needs rules uh, to, to, be, to be respected and it needs to enforce this. So uh, we're not going to return to a, low, to a completely lawless order. But I would say all the hopes that were placed in a better international order. Let's look, for example, at how the West graduated from plundering developing economies uh, from uh, stoking corruption to a number of rules, which even as we speak are not fully implemented, fully respected, but are basically established, especially by international organizations. This would go away. Uh, we'd go back to the previous uh, era. And that, that is uh, quite dangerous. François Godemont is the director of the Asia and China program and a senior policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations in Paris. He also wrote for ECFR a, a fantastic paper, which I highly recommend, particularly for our, our, our listeners in Africa who are learning about the Chinese worldview and foreign policy. Uh, it's Expanded Ambitions, Shrinking Achievements, How China Sees the Global Order. You can find that over on the ECFR website. Just Google that and you'll, you'll come up with it. It should be required reading for any student of international relations uh, because the world order is changing right before our eyes, our eyes right now. China will play a big role one way or another. Uh, we just don't know if it necessarily, necessarily be a force for good for stability, uh, we don't know. So that's what makes this period of time so absolutely fascinating. Francois, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you to you for the interest. I appreciate it. And Kobus, you know, it's hard not to be worried about what we're seeing right now because the rules are changing. And I guess I worry more for Africa than I do for the United States, France, and China because as small powers that are now increasingly in debt, um, I worry that these big shifts will not favor them in any way. So as the rules change with the Chinese, with Trump, with Le Pen, with Brexit, uh, I, I worry the, that the stability for developing countries uh, is in jeopardy. I share that worry. Um, I also think that, you know, developing countries are so vulnerable to, to global movements, for example, things like cli changes like climate change. And we need, you know, a, a functional global system to try and fight these collective threats. Um, and it's the developing countries that are going to be feeling them first. Okay. Well, we'll have more on this topic, and we will continue to follow it closely in the coming weeks and months, particularly as Trump's foreign policy starts to evolve, or maybe doesn't, with relations to Africa, because that will certainly impact the Chinese in Africa. So we hope to, to bring on more guests like this who can kind of talk about these changing dynamics. So we'll be back again next week with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to Facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show or follow China Africa News that's updated every four hours, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadenesk or Eric at Eolander. That's E-O-L-A-N-D-E-R. Subscribe to the China Africa podcast on iTunes or download the mobile apps for iOS, Android, or Windows Phone. Just head over to your favorite store and search for China Africa.